a very good evening and warm welcome to each one of you. I'm Dr. Leera Gupta and I support medical affairs for oncology and immunology at Biocon Biologics. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome each one of you on this special day. Uh, today, we all have gathered uh, on the occasion of International Women's Day. Uh, it's a great thing, a program by women and for women, uh, a day to mark and reinforce the need of a day that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. It's an interesting program, and we have three very important and interesting sessions. One is to increase the awareness on women cancer. Second is about the innovations in women cancer. And third is the challenges uh, faced by women leaders in diverse uh, fields. So uh, for the first session, I would want to invite Dr. Anita Ramesh. Uh, she is the professor and head of medical oncology, Savita Medical College and Hospital, uh, Savita University, Chennai. She is also associated with Apollo and uh, the SCG Cancer Center. So Madam, over to you uh, for the first session on the health promotion or primary prevention and integrated approach in cancer care. Dr. Anita Ramesh, Madam, over yeah. to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, I uh, uh, just sharing my slides. So, uh, I just see the slides. Uh, Ma'am, I request to introduce my panelists. Dr. Sure, 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 sure. So, Neerav, can you yeah, yeah, uh, I'll, present I'll the just screen? Do it. I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Yeah. So, amongst the esteemed panelists for the first session, we have with us Dr. Sabeta Gupta, Chairperson, Gynecology and Gynecology, Medanta Hospital, the Medit City Hospital, Gurgaon. We have Dr. Jyoti Vadva, Senior Director of Medical Oncology and Hematology, Medanta Cancer Institute, Medanta, the Medit City Hospital, Gurgaon. We have Ms. Samara Mahendra, founder and CEO of Carer, a personalized cancer care from New Delhi. Amongst the other panelists, we have with us Dr. Safalta Bagbar, senior consultant, medical oncology, Amrita Hospital, Faridabad. Dr. Palomi Basu, consultant, medical and hemato oncology at Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Cancer Research Institute, Kolkata. Dr. Hani Parikh, Medical Oncologist, Bharat Cancer Hospital and Nirali Memorial Radiation Center, Surat. So, Dr. Anita Ramesh, Madam, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the introduction. I just want to share my slide once again. Okay. Um, okay, just one minute. I shared and we went back again. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay, one minute, just one. My share twice actually. <laughs> um, uh, hmm. Okay, we are on the right slides. Can you yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, very much. Thank you uh, to everybody and. Warm wishes for the uh, festivals as well as for the uh, moment day. Yeah, a lot of noise is there. Can we have uh, all the things created? Um, okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, with this, we start off with the first thing. Now, you know, health promotion and primary prevention, uh, it forms an integral part of the affordable care, quality of care and to give the right integrated approach to cancer care. And without which we will not be able to um, do any of the things. Mm -hmm. And with the recent budget in the healthcare um, sector, I think there is remarkable improvement as far as India is concerned. And we have gone a long way ahead uh, to this. So coming to first question to Dr. Savya Gupta. What is the different types of uh, cancer in women and their prevalence in India? 
You know, Dr. Sabria, we have the recent data from the Globocon out and also the ICMR data. So what do you feel and what will you explain in a general term to the common population saying that different cancers in women and what is the rate and what's the prevalence like? So when we talk of women's cancer in a present day scenario in India, breast cancer tops the list. And the incidence is close to roughly 26%, followed by cervical cancer, which is close to 18.3%. And this is followed by cancer endometrium, which is uh, close to 6.7%, followed by the oral cancer, and then comes the photorectal cancer, and then comes the turn of other cancers. That's how the things are. Again, just coming back to the question one. My voice is cracking. Yeah. Over a period of time, the breast cancer incidence has increased. Okay. And uh, so, uh, if you, uh, how did we come so fast from the um, uh, 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 cancer of the cervix to breast cancer being the highest? Dr. Sabia? I just couldn't hear that actually. Dr. Sabia? Yeah. How, uh, no, uh, we, now the commonest cancer as on today is the breast cancer. Hello. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, yes. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. And compared to the cervical cancer, maybe which was two to three years back. So, how, what can be the contributing factors to this uh, breast cancer being the commonest cancer? See, the point is that, Sabia. Is that somebody else? Yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, Dr. Sabia? Yeah. Can you hear me? Better now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, uh, coming back to this graph, if you see the graph, the common prevalent cancers are the breast, cervical, ovarian, and endometrial. Right. Now, if you see the common uh, uh, Globocon data this year, so this is the swap has happened where the cervical cancer is now becoming the second largest and the breast cancer is the common. Okay, so just a few, few points from you, Dr. Gupta, Sabiata Gupta, that why do you think this swap has happened? I think some awareness regarding the cervical cancer and, you know, though we don't screen our patients to that extent, but yes, some awareness, some uh, better uh, environment, it has brought the cervical cancer down, some screening contributing, some vaccination contributing, and of course, some uh, better socioeconomic status, which is playing its uh, role. So the cervical cancer has come down a bit and uh, breast, of course, stays the same and uh, the other thing is maybe, you know, better uh, identification and diagnosis of breast cancer. And that's how the incidence seems to be more than, not seems, it's actually more than, it's detected more than the normal. You yeah. Find. So, yeah, what you said is correct that, yes, we have uh, have the cervical cancer vaccine, awareness have improved, even access to treatment has improved, people are aware of it. And also another point, just to add to what you said, we have become more westernized compared to what we were a couple of years back with a lot of women having um, sedentary lifestyle. Smoking has become a social stigma and then uh, late marriages and then late childbirth, no time for breastfeeding. And uh, all this has added might be a small contributory factor to make breast cancer as the commonest um, uh, cancer as on today. Now coming to Dr. Um, Sapalta uh, Bhagwan. Okay, now do you think the newer modalities of breast cancer screening and how does this, uh, ben how benefits outweighs the risks? And would like to know from you first is that what are the different newer modalities before we go to other discussion, how better it is? So, uh... As such, for a screening modality, we only use mammogram and clinical breast examination. The rest of the things are for the high-risk women, which are like uh, ultra-fast MRI, then uh, uh, 
then digital tomosynthesis of the breast so there are there are other modalities which are like uh, giving as as clear picture as that of the mri but right now we are not using it as a screening in a general population is only for the high risk patient population which is defined already that the patients who are having genetic uh, high, genetically high risk or the patients who are received re radiation uh, between 30 2010 to 30 years of age so these are the patients when we use uh, screening modality uh, newer screening modalities and they are better because they give uh, better vi visibility uh, like for ultra fast mri it is like we inject uh, dye and if it is malignant then within 10 seconds that uptake is there and the benign uh, lesions that will be taking 15 sec uh, 15 seconds after 15 seconds so um, these are the things which are able to refine which are able are uh, give better idea about the lesion and uh, decreases false positivity rate and uh, in fact, like uh, ultra fast MRI that can be done in uh, uh, just five minutes or 10 minutes or so. So in that case, it is the patient who are having claustrophobia or the, the time consumption is less. So that's how it helps as compared to the... Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Sapulka, you are right by saying the newer um, modalities of breast cancer screening, which we really confined as per the guidelines to the IDEX individual. Now, I just want to have some comments from you. There are screening techniques which has developed, like the cervical cancer, which we can do it on site on moment, like ultrasound tomography, ultrasound screening, you took a digital picture in the breast. Well, I, I re really want to know many of the uh, uh, NGOs and trusts which are using this as a screening modality, how good they are, would you recommend them? And I want to have your thought process on that. One thing is thermoelastography of the breast that is used uh, that is used by the NGOs and all. But uh, as such, they are not in the guideline. And how much training they are having and how much it is reproducible, it is very difficult. What I feel uh, uh, rather than that from a modality in a population in a population based screening it's not that good idea as such we are not we don't know how much report is it is and how much trained the personnel is because it is very subjective yeah you are right the newer modalities the smaller ones i know many things have come out they come together with the cervical cancer screening it's a small instrument portable it cost about five to six lakhs people to take it outside but remember they are all to be just used to pick up the eye uh, case and they all need to undergo the conventional digital and ultrasound screening mammogram before uh, uh, definition or a bilax is defined so there are a lot of improvements which are taking place and that's the tomosynthesis mammographing screening unit so you it combines with an x-ray it gives you three-dimensional uh, breast this tomosynthesis has advanced imaging techniques and we have even smaller i have seen and uh, i have seen can we mute uh, the uh, lot of this coming the organizers okay please mute when somebody is not talking okay so uh the uh, these i have seen smaller instruments then they're highly sophisticated and people have purchased it and ngos particularly we cannot say no to it yes but it is definitely not under the guidelines we also need to inform the patient we are just doing it initially next step is to come to the hospital and you have to do the breast examination by the doctor and as well as you need to do the conventional ultrasound and digital uh, map more yes what uh, doctor said holds good how what, there is observer variability you said correctly doctor we don't know the validity of these okay instruments okay and also you said directly we do not know what the results are but yes and i think over a period of time i also attended meetings which are looking into uh, icmr accreditation to these small screening um, uh, things considering india as a big um, uh, state where they are now uh, uh, even back to doctor okay for you doctor um uh, Safalta Bhagmar. So, our comments on yes. these FDA approved diagnostic devices. Yeah. Mm. So, 
these are diagnostic devices as said this is not no use in the screening uh, screening method yes yes and, yes uh, yeah. these are after <laughs> so after it is like diagnosis we do we go ahead with all these things so yeah you're right doctor yeah. they are not included in the screening analysis of any of these foundation one and liquid one is not yeah. approved at upfront it is used yeah. only to be given for patients to when you want to see whether chemo has to be given or not and the yes. um, uh, uh, and not in early stage breast cancer yes we do it when the tissue is not available we do it in advanced cancer to see when the we have already given cdk4 inhibitors pi3 kinase and for all these stage uh, her to positivity okay so these definitely and pdl1 now you know there's a role of immuno uh, immunotherapy in the treatment of triple negative breast cancers yes but then they are all in advanced cancers early stage cancers and metastatic recurrent cancers which has been used okay now coming um, uh, coming to the uh, coming to dr paulomi is dr paulomi available okay Dr. Paul Nomi, what are the benefits of cancer screening? Okay, Dr. Paul Nomi, if Dr. Paul Nomi is she not is, there. She is not yeah, there. Yeah. Basu? yeah, doctor, um, I think she left just now. Uh, Sapta, uh, 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 Dr. Saptalha, please continue with the same questions. What are the benefits <laughs> of cancer screening? My name is, my name is Sapalta. <laughs> Sapalta, sorry. Sapalta, okay, Dr. Sapalta, sorry. Um, please continue with the benefits of cancer screening. So, benefit of cancer screening, like what I said, clinical breast examination as well as mammogram, both have reduced um, mortality by 30% and that too at the, uh, if the females are more than 50 years of age. So these screening modalities are basically... Uh, makes the people makes people aware of having getting these screening done get uh, aware of the cancer that is the most important thing they go deep down in the uh, to the society and if the patient are patient gets aware once they have once they have got a screen done they know that a cancer can develop later on so they are all they are taught about self breast examination if they develop a lump later on they are able to go to the hospital they access the uh, treatment uh, early so most important part of screening is not just screening it is like making the uh, people aware of the cancer yes you're right benefits are it has reduces the late stage presentation so we can go do away with bigger treatments reduce incidence <laughs> reduce the death yes you might be doing an over diagnosis over treatment there may be false positive false negative anxiety in the family psychosocial and these has to be balanced but definitely in a um, uh, in a case of breast cancer, screening has known its place. Now, if Paulumi is back, or shall we go to the? Um, if she's not back, we will just handle this question. Risk factors of endometrial cancer. Yeah, what um, uh, we need to know. Paulumi is there? Okay. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Please tell me. Yeah, yeah. You are not audible. Hello. Okay, so yes, follow me. Uh, yeah, yes, hello, please tell me. Okay, I think you need to come out into an open area for the uh, the voice is breaking. Please. Okay, so with the existing medical conditions like type 2 diabetes, any metabolic syndrome, which is obesity, endometrial hyperplasia, polycystic ovarian disease, Lynch syndrome, they all do uh, 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 expose the people to high risk factors like obesity, what I told you, particularly the pelvic girth in women is quite high risk. Family history of endometrial cancer, which is also mother and sister, particularly breast ovarian cancer syndrome, do have an implication and increasing your potential risk for having this particular cancer. 
Use of tamoxifen, many people we have seen premenopausal tamoxifen, four to five years, comes with vaginal bleeding, and we do a transvaginal ultrasound, the thickening of the endometrium, we need to do a biopsy to rule out that we don't miss on an early stage endometrial cancers. Postmenopausal use of only estrogen hormone replacement. Now you know the hormone replacements have uh, different types of pills adding where a progesterone is also in the content to decrease the risk of these type of cancers. So that's it, Pounami. Well, uh, we couldn't hear you, but we have, I told the points to all of, it, all of them. Now, coming to Dr. Samar, uh, Samar Mahindra. Okay, what is the role of integrative oncology, personalized care, and how are we making difference by collaborating with institutes on this particular aspect? Hi, Dr. Anita, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you definitely. Okay. Yes, please Let tell me. me too, yeah. So integrative oncology, uh, Dr. Anita, is using non-clinical evidence-based therapies, using lifestyle mechanisms such as your nutritional uh, interventions, physical therapy, psychological interventions, complemented. So it's in co it goes a long stream mainstream cancer treatment like your chemo, radiation, surgery, hormonal therapy, immunotherapy to improve the outcomes of patients. So as you had mentioned earlier, cancer today is becoming more of a lifestyle disease. Um, it has, you know, unfortunately a lot of toxins, environmental conditions, obesity, sedentary lifestyles, the wrong nutrition is all really... PCOD is all relating to um, the influence of cancer and increasing your risk of cancer. So when we're treating cancer, we also have to manage the lifestyle condition of the patient. We deal with a lot of head and neck cancer patients where they go through treatment, but then they finish their treatment, they go back to chewing tobacco or they go back to drinking. So lifestyle plays a very important component of treating a patient while going through, um, while going through mainstream cancer care. And that is exactly what integrative oncology is. So what we do is we collaborate evidence-based uh, non-clinical therapies with conventional treatment. Now, um, how we are making this a part of, uh, um, you know, the mainstream treatment by collaborating with institutes. When we sp speak about institutes, we predominantly refer to oncologists, uh, to uh, the healthcare system. So hospitals to with pharma companies um, and the main uh, you know, the main institutes that provide therapy and treatment to patients. So what we do is we just, for example, with an oncologist, we support all the, the, the oncologists with all the su supportive therapies and non-clinical care. We understand oncologists such as yourself don't have enough time and are, of course, inundated with the amount of patients that you see and, um, you know, providing the right treatment is your goal. We just manage all the other elements where the patient has neutropenia or they're malnourished or they need to know what kind of nutrition they need to consume. Same with, you know, patients who go through lymphedema, fatigue, um, you know, muscle atrophy, uh, post-surgical rehabilitation, and of course, the psychological element of care. At, at a time of diagnosis, the patient and the family members are emotionally and, uh, uh, you know, uh, mentally distressed. So helping them get through that is very important. So we partner with oncologists, we partner with hospitals to provide this extension of care into the patient's home. And the outcome and the focus is to improve the quality of life of the patient. Okay, Samara, if, we, if you, if I want to know from you, if you have to tell any woman, okay, she has walked into the OPD and is just diagnosed, has a simple diagnosis of a breast cancer, what would you advise uh, as uh, um, as a uh, for personalized care regarding her diet, her lifestyle, or just in few lines to the patient, not to the healthcare system? Right. How will so, you take it? From? Yes. So, Doctor Anita, anything that we provide to the patient is first signed off by the oncologist. So, whatever protocol we provide to the patient, we first need to do an analysis of medical reports and then the lifestyle, the quality of life of the patient, what is the current status of the patient, what are the pain points. So, there is a very, then we also do a screening, medication screening analysis. So, we get a thorough assessment of what the patient's condition is from a medical and non medical standpoint uh, at the time of diagnosis. And this is done through very highly skin clinical nutritionists physical therapists and clinical psychologists. Once we get that understanding, we design a protocol that we share with the, um, you know, their referring uh, doctor to just get a sign off that this is the 
the proper uh, protocol that we will follow with the patient. So first is the diet plan. The clinical nutritionist will first do a session with the patient, try to understand what kind of nutrition is the patient used to consuming, where do they come from, what can they, uh, you know, actually make at home. And based on all those uh, factors, plus um, the medical reports, a diet plan is created. So it really is personalized to each and every patient. Yeah. Okay. Samana, thank you very much. Okay. But then just a comment to all the women and the doctors here. We also, the large part of the population is below the uh, needy. Okay. They may not have access to many of the sophisticated methodologies, but they do have access to treatment because government provides breast cancer free treatment. So we need to also work in co combination with the government institutions, which are treating huge number of patients. I'm at the medical college and we don't, uh, we treat, we have high rates of survivors because the, all the treatment of breast cancer is free. But yes, this integrated approach is still missing and we are looking for people who is going to integrate with the government and provide these women huge amount of uh, care. Coming to Dr. Honey, yes, who are the, uh, coming to the cervical cancer, uh, uh, please, there's a lot of noise with organizers, okay, only unmute the person whom we are going to discuss, okay. Yes, Dr. Honey Parekh, okay, who are at risk of cervical cancer and what guideline recommends for the early screening and how do you go about with screening, Dr. Honey? Um, maybe Hello, yes. am I audible? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, you're very much audible. Yeah. Please. So, so patient females who are having multiple sexual partners with poor uh, hygiene, uh, multiple pregnancies, uh, HPV infections, uh, low immunity like HIV patients, uh, IUD. Uh, it can be also a risk factor because of hygiene and issues. So, these are some of the uh, risk factors. Smoking is also a risk factor. So these are some uh, common risk factors leading to cervical cancers. That is what you're pointing at, human papilloma virus, HPV yeah. infections yeah. of 16, 18, 31, and 33. They are the common strains which are causing. And you correctly said everything that multiple sexual partners, sexual hygiene are not, uh, um, uh, not uh, um, proper in place. So look, uh, doctor, please look at this map. Okay, to me, the map is appearing empty. Now, which are the areas in the map would you like to draw if it is said that the, this place has high risks of cervical cancer? So, uh, like uh, in the areas, Rajasthan and uh, then uh, center Bihar, UP, uh, Odisha, so these areas. So these are the common areas having high uh, risk cervical cancer, high number of cervical cancer patients. Yes, you're right. Particularly the rural areas, Bardsi. Remember, we had a Bardsi um, yeah. center, one of them. Even Tamil Nadu has in the rural areas one of the high percentage of cervical cancer. So cervical cancer is more towards the rural India. Okay, and uh, the urban India is now seeing more of breast cancer. So that's what very correctly you said. Doctor, coming to the next question to you is how do you how can you prevent these cervical cancers? And in your practice, do you give vaccination? So uh, vaccination we recommend between uh, after the age of nine. So girls with 9 to 14 age, two doses sufficient. And after 14, three dosage of vaccines uh, uh, are recommended. And both cervarix, uh, double uh, and quadrivalent. So both can be given. And the pro protective mechanisms like uh, usage of condoms, contraceptions with, during sex, uh, smoking, and uh, avoid promiscuous sexual activity. These are the common uh, guidelines uh, in the, uh, which we give to our patients. And uh, then early screening, like after 26 uh, pep smear test in years, and after 30 years, testing five years and or pep smear every three years till the age of 65 years. So these are the screening uh, recommendations which we give to our patients for early diagnosis of cervical cancer. 
Okay, yes, uh, what you said is correctly for quit smoking and I seen alcohol is also involved in this and then avoid promiscuous sexual activity with HPV virus. Even HIV patients now are also high risk of exposed to the cervical cancer and vaccination correctly you said. Before we move uh, to the next question, doctor, and I think that is also related to the life course of the HPV infection. Now you rightly said in India, approval is from nine till 14 up to maybe before your first sexual intercourse. You can give it up to the age of 45 provided you are not exposed. That's the thing. And uh, now I uh, just wanted to know there is an Indian vaccine which is also coming up. You know, the ICMR uh, must be I read the news in the newspaper and it was all in the TV. India has started producing Indian anti HPV virus. So, your comments on that. Now, we are all using foreigns, the Gardasil and Sarbisil. That's what we are using 3,000 rupees, 2 to 3,000 rupees per dose. Indian vaccine and New York government, how will you tell your patient? See, we need to look India into the as a whole. I also told Samara the same thing, to you also the same thing. Again, so if you have mass vaccination, cheaper Indian made vaccine, how will you proceed? So, uh, we right now it's cheaper. So, and in India with such a populous country, we need something cheaper because spending 3000 or uh, like whole dose will cost them around 6 to 10000 that is not cup of tea for every indian so if we want to uh, decrease the incidence of cervical cancer which is the second most common cancer we have to find some way of a cheaper vaccine but its efficacy and uh, uh, efficacy safety will be uh, they, uh, we will be able to discuss only after a few years of its usage. Right now, we can't comment on those things. So, uh, we can uh, explain this to our patients uh, regarding uh, that uh, efficacy and safety point. And uh, I think for mass vaccination, uh, we can recommend because uh, as per news and all this, they are going to uh, inculcate it in a uh, mandatory vaccination program also. So uh, maybe in future, uh, it's going to be like, uh, you know, in a vaccination program and uh, we will be able to vaccinate maximum of our uh, young girls with this vaccine. But uh, yes. safety and efficacy will be debatable at present. Yes, you're right, honey. Okay. Um, see, what you said was very, uh, but mass vaccination is needed because we have to consider other women who are uh, not in a capacity to buy this. And, and India being a hub for vaccination, and you know the story of pediatric cancer is excellent vaccination system. We have done too well in COVID, and we are also proud of our vaccine makers uh, like Serum Institute, Bharat Biotech, and they are the ones which are producing these vaccines. So I'm very, very optimistic, and I feel that will be, on a, again, another game changer where majority of the women in India gets this vaccine, and that's the day when we will be knowing, yes, we have done something for the cervical cancer. Yes, what you said is correct. We need to more have more trials. Sometimes trials may not be possible. Like what we COVID, we had a rapid pass through for the approvals. I think they are ICMR and DCGI is working together to bring these vaccines into the country, hopefully. And I think they will be good also. Okay. And uh, coming to you, um, uh, just quickly, these are the guidelines. When do you screen? What is the age of screening in India? Quickly, if you just tell the points before we move on to the next question. So... As I told you, right after 21 to 29 uh, cervical cytology, that pap smear is sufficient every three years. And after 30, uh, HPV testing is recommended along with uh, uh, cervical cytology, that's pap smear, until 65 years of age. Yes, you can do this screening. Still cervical uh, cytology, HPV testing is done at many places. Coming to Jyoti Vadma. Now, could you share your thoughts on the government's initiative for screening and early diagnosis of cancer in women? What the guidelines? Yeah, so I would uh, say that government of India has taken many initiatives. In fact, we all know that we have had National Cancer Control Program in place since 1982. Now, in addition to that, in the year 2010, Government, India, uh, Government of India had launched the National Program for Prevention and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Diseases and Stroke. So we know that uh, besides cancer, these are other three very important non-communicable diseases 
and uh, we can attack all of them together uh, with uh, you know some common lifestyle measures so under this program the uh, government has set up various clinics uh, looking at early diagnosis and treatment um, there has been tertiary care cancer centers uh, scheme also there has been a um, focus on oncology in aims like institutions uh, all over india under pradhan mantri swasthya suraksha yojana and uh, besides this we are all aware of ayushman bharat um, and under that also um, various initiatives have been taken towards early diagnosis of cancer and uh, last but not the least we are also aware of national cancer grid which is trying to make everyone come together to formulate uh, standard protocols and guidelines not only towards early detection of cancer but also cancer treatment so a lot is being done but because of the huge population in india i think uh, we need to continue to make efforts Uh, yeah jyoti you are right okay for the uh, national cancer grid what you said and the major uh, diagnosis and i think um, this pattern in was already there in place and the ngos and government all are working together to see how this national com- uh, control and as you rightly said and it is also should be told to everybody now cancer is a notifiable disease and i think in all places once you detect the cancer it gets uh, notified and we have advanced a lot now is dr paul on me back is dr yeah, paul me can mute uh, yes yes please I'm, come outside somewhere and talk yes you are audible mom me i need to okay. yes yes are you are visible also visible and audible oh. both okay follow me quickly ovarian cancer risk factors challenges and how do you diagnose them okay the main risk factor i think uh, one is age ma'am and the next is early menarche and late menopause nalipariti mm-hmm. is another risk factor smoking causes mucinous the ovary and uh, there are if there is some family history uh, at least one relative uh, one first degree relative have a history of ovarian ca then there is a chances of more than 5% risk increase and another is ma'am if there is any brca mutation positive uh, and uh, then there is a chances of more chances of developing ovarian ca and uh, another is B, uh, if bmi is more than 30 obesity is a risk factor and uh, some benign uh, diseases like endometriosis may cause uh, ovarian ca if patient had had any past history of pelvic radiation Then there is a chances of developing ovarian failure. Yes. These okay, you are correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Main factors. What you said was very much correct to the uh, points uh, alluded. And one of the cancers in women which has a very poor survival, and uh, we really don't know. Sometimes they come so late. Uh, Dr. Sabhyata Gupta, guidance and advice in general for maintaining this health. How will you tell your uh, lady patients what to do? just in simple lines okay sure. simple words sure hmm. they need to realize that their health is the most important thing in the world that is the first thing and uh, so they should not be neglecting their clinical symptoms they should be reporting their clinical symptoms immediately be it uh, the physical health or the mental health eat healthy exercise regularly maintain healthy weight they must practice safe sex they should not be smoking or chewing tobacco they should uh, i mean if they fall into the purview of uh, vaccination the cervical cancer vaccination that should be taken timely and uh, in fact i am very hopeful and i am very optimistic that sh- certainly you know this uh, server the our uh, indian vaccination that's a server vac is going to be the game changer there's no doubt about it i think i firmly believe that. and uh, yes yes doctor they must know their family history of cancer they should be aware of that so that whenever they visit the doctor they should be sharing that history and must go for periodic health checkups must follow the cancer screening protocols we just discussed that when and what is to be done periodically to screen breast cancer to screen cervical cancer so that is important they should follow those protocols 
And uh, I think that is it. That's what I would like to tell yeah, you. Yeah, I think you're right with all the points in place. Uh, we need to just spend a few minutes with the woman who walks into the room, telling her about her health, tell her about good. I also tell them, take lots of fruits, vegetables, yeah. avoid all the sugary diets, and keep the your pelvic girth smaller. Yeah, that's the important thing. All risk factors. Yes, control your diabetes, control your hypertension. I tell them to sleep for eight hours. Okay, yes, if you want, social pressure may be there, but don't smoke, don't drink. Otherwise, until and unless it is socially, in eight hours of sleep and do a little bit of yoga. That's something I wanted to add with you. Safalta, I think I pronounced it right. Safalta, quickly, uh, screening and prevention so of women headaches of breast cancer. Yeah, I am yes. right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> come, come. Hmm. Yes, so, come. tell me. One thing, hmm. screening for high-risk breast cancer patient, it is like, uh, first we'll have to uh, find out who are the women who are high risk of breast cancer. So uh, there are different guidelines. There are different, uh, uh, like NCCN that says, these are the high risk. So the patient who is having BRCA mutation, the patients and their first degree relative of a BRCA mutation patient, or the patients who had undergone radiation between 10 to 30 years of age, who had uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia, then lobular hyperplasia. These are the patients. And guidelines say is how uh, these screenings to be done, like before 30 years of age. Uh, like 30 year, at 30 years of age, we go for the MRI breast if the patients are high risk. And uh, later on, it is like uh, more than 40 years of age, we, we go ahead with the mammogram. And plus, a, and apart from that, we'll ha also have to counsel them about the lifestyle changes they have to do and what to do the cells press examination, getting the clinical press examination done and regular screening done. So this is how like we'll have to first recognize the virus patient and uh, according to that screening to be done. Yeah, this is the uh, guidelines, 40 women per age, okay, and then uh, 70, 74, or you, you are very frail, it is less than 10 years, annually is the screen, and uh, 3D mammo, uh, ultrasound, um, 20, 40 years per age, and digital mammogram, okay, coming to Dr. Honey. Okay, early diagnosis endometrial cancer, what we can do, something that will, uh, to facilitate early diagnosis. Dr. Honey? Dr. Honey is there? Yeah. Okay. Or can no, we go? So the tumor on the lining. Okay. Okay. The most common symptoms you group for the vaginal bleeding. Uh, in, uh, some people have that endometrial cancer is if you have done a cervical uh, pap smear, you are uh, uh, you are doing good with the endometrial cancer, but that should not be the thing because pap smear does not tell you about endometrial cancer. Coming back to Dr. Samara uh, Mahindra, okay, what is your view uh, in and what difference will you make in early stages of treatment strategies? You, how will you tell a common person or your initiative, okay, to come early so that your stage is low and your survival figures are high? So, I mean, I know you're doing a lot of good job. So, how do you do with the common people? So, I think uh, I think what, uh, you know, Dr. Gupta, what you, you yourself said, it all lies in screening. Although we work with most patients post-diagnosis, everything comes mm -hmm. back to early screening and, and prevention. I mean, if you want to see a cancer-free India, it's all about early screening and detection. Uh, so, what we do is when we work with uh, patients is we always encourage the family members to make it a habit and make it actually regular in their lifestyle to start screening early, uh, to do the tests required, uh, as Dr. Gupta said, to go in and to speak to doctors about their family history of cancer and to actually incorporate these lifestyle changes in their lives. Um, so as you had mentioned before, we want to do this in a mass level. We're actually working with multiple state governments ourselves, um, where we are, while we provide the lifestyle therapies to patients, uh, on treatment, um, even the screening mechanism uh, that we are initiating is also happening through uh, the program that we uh, provide to patients who are diagnosed. So it all really, it all lies in screening and uh, early detection. That's the answer. When we get a patient who's been screened and who's been detected with the early stage cancer, as you would, uh, it's a very hopeful situation. They respond to treatment better. They respond to therapy better. And then you see a full recovery. So it's always, yes. um, it's yeah. always more hopeful. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Coming back to quickly, to Dr. Honey, current status, awareness, how much of your patients know about this vaccine? Are they afraid they want to take? Uh, Dr. Honey Parikh? Uh, doctor? Okay, if he was not there, I'll just answer on behalf of you. Yes, DCGI has approved. It is, see, it was there in the, it's still there in the guidelines of National Cancer Control Program, uh, cervical or the National Vaccination Program, cervical cancer vaccination is optional. It is written along with the pediatric vaccine. So it is not that, it is not there, it is already there. The DCGI has approved this Indian vaccine, Cervavac. 200 to 300 rupees, maximum 400. Government colleges, uh, hospitals, I think, is giving free where you don't need to pay. And it is given to female. Male, I'm not sure whether approval there is in India, but female, it is there. But male approval is there in US because they all have, are prone to oral sex and the same virus, human papilloma virus, which causes oral cancer, might cause oral cancer is meant. But men in India, I'm, I'm not sure about men in India. Female, I'm, I'm sure about the guidelines is there. Single dose vaccine, HPP, yes, women in Kenya. It will be also a good thing as far as India is concerned. We do have nasal vaccines for COVID. It's highly um, appreciated by many people. Back to Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti, practice making difference in compared to Western world. Uh, how do you look into India? Jyoti. In India, we know that uh, the uh, cancer screening figures are quite low. So, uh, and I think there are three main barriers if we want to address this important issue of low cancer screening or low acceptance for cancer screening, then we need to overcome three barriers. And these three barriers are three A's, I would put it as A for awareness, second A for access, and the third one for affordability. So um, there is lack of awareness about cancer per se, and also about the risk factors for cancer, and also about the screening guidelines. And people most of the times are not even aware that screening tests are available. Then the other important factors are that uh, they uh, have the fear of undergoing the screening test. Um, they are uh, also embarrassed. Uh, to undergo cancer screening. Sometimes the distance to a screening center or screening clinic is a hindrance. They also, especially the women in rural India, they lack the support uh, from rest of the family. And uh, sometimes the cost of a particular screening test uh, may not be affordable uh, for quite a few uh, Indian women. So if we can look into all these barriers, uh, of lack of awareness, uh, lack of access, uh, and lack of affordability, then only we can, you know, match up with the Western figures uh, of people undergoing cancer screening at the right age, getting the cancer detected early, and getting it treated in a much better manner with much better outcomes. So we have yes, to yes. have a multi-pronged approach. Yeah, many things to be done. I still, yeah, but much we are much better than before urban and rural. And you see the figures, yeah, yeah, yeah much, much better than yes. both. Uh, improving. And uh, even for many of the things, these master health checkup and many of the places free, they have uh, nice packages and government institution, you don't need to pay anything for it. Olumi, your advice to family for healthcare promotion and women. Okay. Dr. Paolo, 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 First of all, an awareness is very much necessary because they have, if there is any positive family history, then they have more risk of developing cancer. And secondly, they should be aware of any sign of symptom. And if they have any suspicious kind of symptom, then they should consult with the doctor because uh, they are more prone to develop cancer, like uh, breast CA. Uh, if BRCA mutation is positive, then they should uh, do MRI breast. And if uh, ovarian CA history, any family history of ovarian CA is there, then along CA125, along with pelvic USG is necessary. Yes, so according right. to the screening yeah, guideline, yeah. they should mm -hmm. follow the screening guideline. Yeah, Especially we should pick them up. Yeah, we should yeah. put them at the pre-invasive cancer state, okay? Not at the yeah. invasive state, and that's how you can. 
and this with Early this diagnosis. I would clearly diagnosis. So we have looked into the woman health. We have seen the cervical cancer, breast cancer, the screening guidelines, the accessibility, the awareness, the economics, the healthcare workers, NGOs who are working with us, and the doctors, their inputs. So with this, I think uh, we had a good discussion. Thanks to all the uh, panelists, thanks to the doctors and everybody, and also to the organizers. Thanks to Biocon and uh, for having all of us together. And I know we overshooted the time. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anita, madam. Uh, it's great listening to all of you um, on this day of raising awareness and helping women across India and uh, overseas. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we'll move on to the next uh, session. Uh, that is innovation uh, in uh, women cancers. Um, uh, I'll invite uh, Dr. Uh, Poonam Patel, madam, for moderating this session. Uh, do we have Dr. Poonam joined in? Yes, yes, I'm very much there. Yes, ma'am. Great, very much thank there. you. Great, great. Thank you so much, yes. ma'am, for joining in. It's such a pleasure to have you as moderator. Uh, we know, everybody knows Poonam Patel, madam. Uh, she's a well-known person in the field of medical oncology. Uh, senior consultant, medical oncologist, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, madam, I'll hand over to you for taking this session in innovations in women cancers. So over to you, ma'am. Thanks. So thank you very much. And uh, I will share my screen. Uh, are you able to all see it? Uh, yes, madam, we can see it. Okay. So here we are. I don't know. I can't see my screen, but. Okay. Mm, just put it full screen. Yeah. Yes, we can I see it. Put it. Okay. So I think we are running short in time. So may I invite my panelists? Uh, are my panelists there? Dr. Neeti, Dr. Shevanti, Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Ganjan. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. So, uh, okay. So today my uh, panel discussion is all on innovations in management of women's cancer. Uh, women themselves are very innovative and I don't think so there can be a world without women anyway. But let's talk on innovations, what can happen in management of women's cancer. The 1960s was a landmark in the history of young women's cancer where gestational trophoblastic disease, which was a universally fatal disease, was announced to be a curable disease. And efforts transformed a fatal disease, one of the first diseases that was ever cured with chemotherapy. And now I think with technology improving, uh, there are many diseases in women which are cured, but we definitely need more innovations to improve the cure rates, reduce the side effects, and uh, improve the uh, quality of life. So to begin with cancer diagnosis, Dr. Gunjan, uh, can you just throw some light on what are the newer diagnostics in women's cancer identification? Absolutely, ma'am. I think um, the most common cancers in women being cervical cancer and breast cancers. And I think we are lucky that we have such uh, new techniques available for screening methods. Like when it comes to cervical cancer screening, I think our country has done a lot of commendable work, starting with the VIA techniques. And now we are refining it. We are able to move ahead on that path. And we have instruments like colposcopy available now that are able to incorporate the diagnostic technique with the computer technology so that there's more uh, faster results that are easily reproducible, technology driven. Yes. And then so, we have, yes, ma'am. Yeah, please go ahead. And uh, I think cervical cancer has long troubled our women. So uh, it's very essential that the easy technology that is available at the masses, because when we are conducting the screening programs in the field, manpower deficiency is very important. So we cannot take the pathologist everywhere with us. So if we are able to incorporate these screening modalities with the artificial intelligence, like we are able to do these days, 
that saves a lot of time and the results are more reproducible. Yeah, exactly. So what you said, hand-hand digital colposcopy has really changed the world of diagnosis in uh, cancers of cervix. And the optical dynamics which this enhanced visual assessment uses is really something which is commendable. And it gives superior visualization of cervical surface morphology and it can be studied later and very small instrument compared to what we have otherwise. HPV testing also, which is kind of a pre-cancerous uh, thing that you are trying to look for. Uh, with Ampfire HPV detection system, you are able to identify high-risk individuals. And uh, of course, the deep learning-based evaluation of dual stain cytology for cervical cancer screen. So another thing that I may add here is in breast cancer, where self-examination, though women are taught yet they are not able to do it completely. And I see so many devices now in the market, even my neighborhood pharmacy shop has got handheld device for self-examination. And uh, improving breast cancer detection with artificial intelligence-based systems, uh, which are incorporated in MRI, genetic testing, molecular imaging, they're all ways and innovations to improve outcomes for breast cancer as well. So my next question to Dr. Sevanti, uh, she is the master of precision oncology. And uh, Dr. Sevanti, what do you have to say about multiomics approaches towards biomarker discovery, liquid biopsy for early diagnosis in women's cancer? What are your views? So that would be real precision medicine, as you would say. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yes, uh, I'm very excited about uh, early diagnosis with uh, precision screening. Um, I really feel that uh, there's going to be a new horizon for screening measures. And this would be uh, really path breaking uh, because of the way it will play out. And uh, because I'm also involved with a lot of other research efforts other than the one that is already in the market, I know that there is a lot under the surface yet to play out. But this is all coming and this is what is going to define this decade, the screening, blood-based uh, precision screening uh, for women's cancer, not just women's cancer, for all malignancies is going to play out in the next few years. And this is going to be path breaking. It's going to transform the screening strategies worldwide. So I am really uh, optimistic and really uh, waiting for this to play out in this uh, in the next few years. So we do read in papers that Reliance has come out with a kit worth twelve thousand rupees for genetic markers for. Uh, 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 knowing who would be predisposed to develop cancers amongst many other diseases. So have you done any studies with that? Uh, so it, that is actually based on 23andMe. And uh, because it's a strand product, uh, strand uh, uh, we heard from, from um, Dr. Ramesh Hariharan. And uh, there's a lot uh, happening. They have uh, conducted uh, two trials, two large trials to, uh, to present that. A lot of that data is still coming out. Um, they are also uh, doing a lot of work in circulating tumor DNA-based early mm -hmm. diagnosis pan cancer. I'm involved in, these, uh, in the advisory for, for the research development of those trials. And uh, the trials are playing out at multiple centers countrywide. So both for the, for the risk stratification as well as for the screening. Um, from strand genomics, a lot happening. I also uh, work as an advisor for Datar and I'm privy to their data. I'm co-author and first author on many of their efforts. And uh, so I also... Um, I'm aware of the circulating tumor cell uh, in, in uh, early diagnosis of uh, many epithelial malignancies. The tests are already out there. Uh, in, in UK, uh, it has already been launched as a 
standard uh, testing through their uh, screening uh, body and uh, also at nhs and uh, we are waiting for uh, the us trials to play out after the fda breakthrough so uh, so i i just feel and then we have the you have the gallery test in the us um through the grail through through grail the company uh, which is a uh, part of illumina which is already launched the sensitivity is very their sensitivity is 40% the data test sensitivity is above 90% we'll see what the strand tests come up with when once the trials are done but uh, what i mean is uh, liquid biopsy in the arena of screening has already arrived and uh, the the insider data that one is privy to it looks very promising and earlier we thought this was all just talk and and uh, no substance but slowly and steadily the data in this is mounting and this is becoming a reality so promising times i would say yeah so this also figure shows this diagram shows that in a patient of ovarian cancer through every tissue it may be the malignant tissue blood ascites uterine lavage urine or cervix sphere you can get tissues that can tell you the genomics transcriptomics proteomics metabolomics and through ai you can get into a lot and lot of more things so coming to the treatment part of malignancies uh, regarding modalities and pathways to target in management of malignancies uh, i invite dr ekta so dr ekta uh, what do you have to say on attacking cancer from multiple angles and what are the newer treatment modalities that you think are going to be important in this decade is dr ekta there uh no ma'am actually she just left okay uh, i put an humble request to you we will be uh, required to hard stop at uh, 7:15 so if you could kindly help involving on panelists at least for one one question each that yes. will be really great help yes. madam thank you yes thank you ma'am so I think uh, Dr. Ekta is not there, so can I invite Dr. Niti? Dr. Niti, will you be able to take this question? Okay, so I can't see Dr. Niti also. Dr. Niti is there, but somehow uh, uh, we are not able to hear her. So. Dr. Gunjan. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, so, would you be able to say That's... something about the innovations in modalities and pathways to target in management of malignancies? Right, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, traditionally we have relied on chemotherapy, and it is our bread and butter. But I think when we are able to explore more on the pathways. we are discovering drugs that are able to act better and less side effects so when we sit in the opd it actually helps us so all these newer technologies where we are using nano medicine that is allowing better penetration of the drug into the cancer cell or different um, formulation of the previous existing drugs that actually increase their efficacy so these are simple methods that are actually increasing the efficacy of our treatment and along with that i think the tkis they are really useful because whether or not we agree i personally feel sitting in the opd that giving the ease of treatment where you can tell the patient that you only need to take a tablet at home that builds up the confidence the acceptance increases and similarly the case with immunotherapy and a um, few of the malignancies like i am seeing a lot of head and neck cancers and of course uh, lung cancers so there the immunotherapy even in uh, the relapse setting you are able to give hope to the patients so that is wonderful and then i believe that uh, we at cancer hospital gwalior we are also collaborating with icmr to work on the um, the proteomics of the tumors in the head and neck cancers that's one project which is just starting in the initial phases and hopefully we are able to um, come up with some solid results as far as gene therapy and all goes i don't personally have an experience but i'm sure that in future they hold a lot of promise yes exactly dr shevanti what are your views on precision oncology in terms of 
research and treatment. I know you did say about the circulating tumor cells, but could you explain a little bit about this picture, a uh, busy slide that we see here? So, ma'am, uh, my thought process for precision, uh, and I'm biased because um, I feel uh, uh, that's that's my standing statement that there is no other way of treating uh, cancer than uh, practicing precision. Uh, mm. I, I think it's a cliche. I think uh, we all utilize it in all our approaches to our patients. And um, I feel that pre precision should actually include organoids where we do chemosensitivity analysis because 60% of our therapy is still very much based on chemotherapy. And when we uh, think of precision just as genomics, we lose out on that 60%, the approach to the 60%. So I'm a, I'm a big uh, uh, proponent of chemosensitivity analysis. We are short of achieving the best results, but our research should focus on, um, on fine tuning that and including that in the precision me measures, including all the other omics that you just listed. So that's yeah, my two cents. Very well yeah. said. And also with the applications and advantages of digital medicine, as they say, data is the new oil. Uh, yes. Would really uh, go places. Dr. Neeti is uh, now there. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Neeti. So just your opinion on the views on immunotherapy and CAR T cell therapy in women's cancer. I think this is our favorite topic. Whenever <laughs> we as medical oncologists want to talk about <laughs> immunotherapy and more of that. So uh, starting from uh, breast cancer, well, uh, well, yes, we have data in triple negative breast cancer use of pembrolizumab and etezolizumab in advanced stage, but also in early stage, stage two and stage three now. Uh, mm -hmm. We uh, have cervix cancer data and advanced and recurrent cervix cancer in which we PDL1 expressing tumors, we like to give immunotherapy. Newer drugs like tisotumab also, which acts on tissue factor, has been tried. Uh, then for endometrial cancer, we already have good evidence of iotherapy by use of Pembro in combination with Lenvatan uh, and other situations as well. Ovarian cancer, we don't have very good data on IO at this juncture, but in MSI expressing tumors everywhere, yes. But in mm. uh, ovarian cancer, a different use of immunotherapy could be possibly dendritic cell vaccine, ma'am, which probably there is some initial data of use of autologous vaccine and even allogenic pooled vaccines, which have been tried in various centers. Although it's not standardized at this juncture, but there is emerging data of the same. Uh, as regards to CAR T cell, well, uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cell basically requires a target and therefore relapsed ALL or relapsed uh, high grade uh, B cell lymphoma as well has CD19 or CD20 as a target. But at the same time, we are looking for more targets in ovarian uh, cancer, breast cancer, breast and cancer, even cervix cancer. cancer. So I think eventually yeah. we'll be using CAR T. I think less than five years to go before we'll have CAR T in solid tumors as well. So we are going yeah, to have some have great, great time. time. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Jyoti Gupta, how do you identify uh, uh, quality of biosimilar in women's cancer management? Um, I'm biosimilar, I think they have changed a lot in the treatment of uh, uh, patients. If you talk about immunotherapy, sorry, targeted therapies, if before the uh, advent of biosimilars, it was really difficult for everyone to get this uh, drug. But after the um, biosimilars were introduced, the use of this uh, uh, targeted therapies they have increased and uh, they are uh, giving the benefit to the patient. So uh, when talking about biosimilars, I think it is purity, potency and efficacy, which are very important uh, while considering which drug to be used uh, in place of that particular uh, drug. Yeah. So, uh, so ma'am, so if you don't mind, yes. sorry to interject. We need to uh, we need to stop to hand over okay. to Dr. Jyoti Bajpayee, okay. madam. Okay. With apologies okay. and uh, really sad that we are interrupting this, but uh, uh, we will connect again for the next session some yeah, other sure, time. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but thank you so okay. much for wonderful moderation Thanks and all lot. our team Thanks panelists for your input. Thank you so much. Over thank to you, you Dr. Bajpayee. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, indeed, a wonderful and very intense discussion on cancer, mm -hmm. women cancers. But uh, now, uh, you know, we are moving on another uh, orbit and uh, we have some eminent panelists.
uh, for this wonderful uh, you know session so this will be certainly a brainstorming discussions which you are going to hear uh, so women leaders uh, truly in the sense and their journeys we are going to discuss in uh, next uh, you know around 90 minutes uh, this uh, this essentially the topic is challenges to women leaders and uh, what are the proposed solutions from uh, their own their own experiences so um, without taking uh, much of the time i would like to call upon all my panelists on board so we have uh, so uh, you know uh, i'm welcoming each one of you in the virtual city of uh, mumbai uh, and uh, people from different uh, part different specialties across the india are joining us here so we have uh, ms uh, sujatha sonik with us additional chief secretary uh, she is uh, in the services department government of maharashtra and she is also a chekami fellow from harvard university we have with us uh, air marshal arti sarin vsm she is director general medical services air forces we have with us uh, ms tejasvi satpute indian police services deputy commission of police uh, in mumbai then we have with us uh, dr shagun sabarwal she is uh, she is the very essence and soul of women lift health who's doing a lot of work for women upliftment and she is south asia region and global monitoring evaluation and learning director for this uh, we have with us ms sangmitra singh who's lead policy and programs population foundation of india we have with us ms aisha choudhury was consultant world bank advisor at stanford university of india and also an adjunct professor for iit jodhpur we have with us uh, dr and professor reena nair who is a very very senior consultant one of the pioneer in medical oncology in india and uh, she is at present in tata medical center kolkata uh, proponent for women in oncology uh, we have with us dr shachi advyatka the manager of child health and development uh, children's investment fund foundation we have with us uh, uh, ms swati pande for she is a postmaster general uh, department of post india and a lot of innovation and support to underprivileged women we have with us dr smita kayal very dear colleague and friend and she is uh, head of the department of medical oncology at Ch chipmer um, uh, so i uh, wish uh, you know all of you to come on the virtual dais we also have uh, dr anita ramesh who is professor and head medical oncology you have just been introduced with her she is our chair for this session so without taking much of the time i am um, uh, i wish to share my screen neera will you allow me yes yes ma'am you can so am i, am I my slides are visible yes ma'am it is visible just put it full screen right so uh, here we begin so uh, you know this picture is uh, uh, you know showing uh, my uh, you know my alma mater tata memorial center and also uh, some of the slogans which suggest that we have to be passionate towards something which you really believe in so um, now i would like to uh, you know start with uh, dr sarin uh, you are on board and you have changed your uniforms very fast i would like to hear from you your journey and uh, you know when you were changing roles in your journey what you, what you really wish to highlight and what you wanted to uh, actually do differently when you see in retrograde and what is your uh, kind of uh, suggestion towards the people who are listening to you and also i have uh, put uh, in this slide couple of uh, suggestions questions if you want to uh, take any of those as well. can you see me yeah absolutely pleasure to see you hi hi jyoti how are you yes yes so you know um you've just mentioned all the things uh, it's been a very long journey for me for about 37 years in the armed forces in the armed forces uh, the branch that i am in has had women from 1950 uh, they are very used to um, you know working um, at par with women we've always had a parity and we our challenges have been common across the board we've had managerial and leadership roles from from day one you can say because we are we we you know we are doctors we are medical officers we are also leaders we lead men in you know and battle and we lead troops so we have managerial as well as leadership roles very early in our careers and our uh, we are we have we are very much uh, you know we now are very much gender neutral we are moving towards we don't have any 
kind of issues I, you know, that I can even talk about on this forum. And we, I've had equal opportunities to climb this ladder. As you can see, I have reached uh, the uh, one of the highest positions I can in my particular branch. And I am the 16th general that has been produced by this core. So, I mean, I'm not the first. There are plenty of role models before us. And uh, the most op important obstacle would be probably yourself. I mean, you have to just, you know, think that I can do it and have and be lucky enough, of course, be fortunate to have an atmosphere around you that helps you move in your career. So I can uh, say that as um, I have been able to, you know, you know, uh, transgress across various, uh, you know, jobs, first starting as a doctor, then as a radiologist, and as an oncologist, now as an administrator, now overseeing the medical services of an entire force. It's been a long journey. And uh, I think we need to mentor, we need to mentor our juniors, we need to teach them what is to be done next in leadership roles. That's the most important. That's what I would like to say. So it's uh, very uh, nice to hear from you and uh, you could manage and navigate the path uh, more effectively, I would say. Uh, we have with us Dr. Uh, Tejasvi Sarpute. So um, I would uh, like to hear from you now, uh, you know, you Indian police service is uh, one of the very, very demanding and commanding job. And uh, generally it is identified as a male dominating branch. So I really uh, want to hear from you uh, what was your experience right from the beginning here, uh, behavior of your, uh, you know, colleagues, juniors, seniors, at times, uh, at times we keep hearing and we keep experiencing. I will show you of the uh, you know, slide uh, also. This is a gender climate in Indian oncology. This is only, this is a medical fraternity uh, wherein we have done, we have tested in from, of, you know, objectivity. And we found that uh, women face a lot of challenges when they are rising the ladder. So on the workforce, they join equally and at times uh, even more while in graduation careers. But as they rise later, the women started dropping out and in managerial or leadership roles, there are less women. So what is your experience and your hurdles? Because it is even more, uh, you know, a, a job which is more identified as heroes branch, not sheroes. Good evening, all. Uh, yeah, very nice to be uh, the part of this uh, forum today. And uh, as we all know that uh, all IAS, IPS, they got selected through the exam of UPSC in which uh, there is no reservation for uh, the ladies and uh, for all other, uh, like, like all other male colleagues, we uh, get selected through this uh, examination. And when we uh, come on the field, uh, my experience is very positive. We are given all the opportunities that are given to our uh, male colleagues. Uh, as um, me, myself, have uh, headed two districts before coming to Mumbai as a, a DCP. Uh, I was an SP of uh, Solapur district. I was SP of Satara. Before that also, I have uh, uh, done uh, those postings which earlier my male colleagues have done. So though we are uh, very less in number, but uh, we uh, uh, don't... Uh, uh, feel any discrimination uh, by our uh, hierarchy, our seniors. And uh, uh, to the large extent, we can say uh, from the society also. But yes, uh, there are certain areas where the uh, lady is serving for the first time. Uh, she is not neutrally seen. Uh, she is seen with a question. And then she has to prove herself. And once uh, you prove yourself after certain period of time uh, you are accepted so uh, it's not about uh, it's not seen in our hierarchy because uh, all understand uh, uh, the thing that uh, women are equally capable and have given the same exam and have entered in the services but uh, uh, in uh, uh, some areas uh, uh, we feel this that society is still not believing uh, into the uh, women and their capabilities and they uh, start with a question mark and uh, Yes, once you prove, then uh, they too uh, uh, appreciate you a lot and uh, uh, give all the appreciation and love. 
but uh, like wherever i go i am asked this question as police is the male dominated field uh, how do i feel and how do i manage so uh, i feel uh, it very surprising that why this question comes to only ladies why not to the males because it is challenging for them as well so uh, uh, this question coming to us it's itself is a discriminatory positively or negatively might be but then i uh, proudly and happily say that my power doesn't come from my muscles and it does come from my brain and my uh, capability to interpret the laws and it comes from the constitution so uh, uh, like on field if i say as a lady i don't uh, face any uh, different problem than my male colleagues whatever problem i am facing even they are facing so uh, whatever uh, positive things and uh, whatever good experiences bad experiences i get from the society my male colleagues too get it so uh, uh, like very happy to share on this platform that yes there is no discrimination and uh, equally we are able to uh, perform and equal appreciation uh, to the large extent we are getting from the society so uh, so i so i i am glad that yes there are opportunities which are uh, you know equal and uh, uh, you know people are uh, making their path in leadership positions but uh, you know many times we feel that there are uh, there are some conscious biases which exist more important than then there are subconscious biases also so uh, i will i will come back to you uh, on that as well and especially i want to understand that what is your junior colleagues perception and behavior and we really want to hear from you uh, your soul your heart and your brain everything together that how they feel to take commands and orders from a lady officer especially when you are new you were new in the system and i completely agree with you that when there is a mob in front or oh, you know how so ever strong is your muscles are it is your brain and your learning and your constitution which support you and no amount of physical uh, you know uh, attributes can control a mob in front of you whether it is a male or a female uh, officer so with that i would uh, again come back to you know these uh, this uh, survey which is which uh, which i really rate high although uh, you know uh, of course there is a there is a bias that uh, you know i was uh, one of the person who was involved with this uh, you know survey but we uh, you know we have done an mcq based survey to all and also in depth uh, questions to few of the colleagues which from uh, different age groups and then we found that people say that they are not bothered so much with the conscious bias and the laws and uh, the rules uh, rules of the land are uh, more or less similar but it is the subconscious biases which are you know predominating and as you uh, some uh, some of the point you said that you need to prove especially when you are new people try to validate and this validation at times becomes time and again so there comes uh, you know a challenge i will uh, move on to dr shagun sabarwal and uh, i i wish your you to hear from you you are doing a lot of great work with women left india and uh, uh, your experience uh, you know uh, in this regard your exp- and also why uh, why you have taken this mission forward thank you so much uh, dr bajpai and first i just want to congratulate you and thank you for getting us all together to discuss something so very important and i think it's still not often talked about and doesn't get the kind of attention that it deserves and i'm really happy to be in in the middle of so many amazing women leaders like yourself and the some of the other panelists so i think you know um, i feel what happens uh, specifically in the case of health and you know of course uh, gender inequality is a huge problem overall you look at any sector women always are uh, you know kind of uh, not being able to rise up the way uh, the way they should because there's not a lack of talent there's not lack of training there's not lack, lack of qualification despite all of that uh, we are not even being able to uh, to get to where we should be which is the decision making tables and i think it's very important to recognize that when you don't have diversity in leadership and you don't have diversity in decision making who sitting on the table whose voices are being heard when you are designing uh, research programs when you are thinking about where we should invest when you are thinking about health policy makes a big difference to ultimately what gets designed right in health the situation i think is even more unique because the workforce globally we know it's 75% 
90% of the health workforce are women around the world. And yet, when you start to look at the leadership positions, you see it's only 25% of women. And when you look at C-suite positions, and it's even less, it's only 5% of women were represented in C-suite positions. And if you then look at the low and middle income countries representative, it even falls shorter. So definitely, I think there are a lot of things that need to be done. For Women Lift Health, our mission has been to really focus on mid-career women. And we get this question, asked this question a lot of times by mid-career women. And what data shows is that mid-career women are women who have experience of 10 to 20 years. They have a lot of uh, you know, expertise. They have a lot of experience. And yet something starts to happen at that level where they are not able to move to very senior leadership position. They either get elbowed out or they drop off or they just stagnate. So one of the things that we have been thinking about is that there may be some internal barriers as well as external barriers. When it comes to internal barriers, I think it's very important to acknowledge that the way the social conditioning of women has happened, there are times where we are not able to uh, maybe necessarily navigate the organizational politics that we need to, right? Or we are not able to maybe... Um, and it's not really our fault, but you do need some support to think about that mindset shift, that emotional intelligence that we need when you have to take decisions in the face of uncertainty. So Women Lift Health is doing this through its flagship program called the Leadership Journey, where we are really bringing together 30 women leaders in health who are mid-career and trying to take them through this experience. It's not a training. You, They are already talented women. We're not trying to teach you something, but it's just helping you kind of just be a much better version of yourself and, and you know have more power in that sense. But that's one thing. I think the other thing to be clear about is that we can't just put onus only on women. It's not just women's problem. And okay, now we have to drive the agenda. We have to drive this change. We also need to work with institutions. Institutions need to have this, uh, this thinking that, okay, we really need to make this not be a man's world. Everything has been designed accordingly, right? So there are multi-pronged uh, approaches. And the last thing I would say is I also think it's very important at the societal level to create norm change. And that can only happen if you spotlight women leaders. Um, if younger girls see who that there are women leaders out there in science, in health, who are doing such excellent work. You know, one of our mentors says, you cannot be what you cannot see. So for our, you know, that is why it's very important to do these kind of conversations. I'll stop there. I can go on and on. As you know, I'm very passionate about it, but I'll stop here. So thank you very much. I think very well uh, summarized and I'll come back to you again, uh, you know, for uh, another question. So you rightly said you can't, uh, you can't if you can't see, you really can't uh, dream it also. So there has to be in societies at different levels, uh, those kind of examples. And I'm glad that uh, these awareness is increasing. People are uh, more aware. People are more ready to accept also. Because uh, many times, you know, I, I also face this, you know, now I'm working for SARC countries. I'm working for India uh, in the oncology sector, of course, and in the European Society of Medical Oncology also. So as uh, the exposure is getting widened, I'm facing that uh, the women colleagues and different, and not only the very nascent budding oncologists, some of the very established people, some in the middle career, and uh, some even uh, beyond that also, but they say when you, they talk one by one to one, rather when they are talking forum, the voice is slightly changed. And because they start being calculative and they also weigh uh, that, you know, if I say this more, promptly what will be uh, the you know effects so i think uh, these all things are uh, uh, much related with the societies institutions and we need to make a change as dr shagun sabarwal very rightly said at all levels so i will move to um, uh, ms aisha so aisha uh, you know you you are uh, from the finance side and a lot of time you know this is a question in all over the sector that women are less paid for the same amount of skill same amount of work uh, the, when, the, when it comes on negotiation table, uh, they are offered less salary and it is the expectation that uh, they should be compromising. Generally, it is also because of the different biology and different training uh, that uh, women do not uh, negotiate so, so much as our main men colleagues very easily do that. So your uh, thoughts on that and, and otherwise also what message you want to give us? Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Bajpai. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm glad to hear such wonderful thoughts from all the other colleagues. And big thanks to the Tata Memorial Center to actually enable this. You pointed out rightly that, yes, a lot of times there is this perception that you don't want to give very important work to women and therefore you don't want to give them a higher salary as well. However, I think what I really want to point out here, you know, 
it goes back to the same point which a lot of us have mentioned that there are these two types of barriers women tend to face one is what are these common barriers with a lot of women face which are mostly the external barriers that how you are perceived as an individual what is the kind of behavior what is the kind of access you get at your workplaces but one has to remember there are there is a second kind of barrier which is very unique to you as an individual how you perceive yourself what you think of yourself and therefore how you want to present yourself what is your leadership presence that you want to leave when you walk into such professional uh, organizations so i think yes that perception that external barrier continues to be there but if we are really able to address this internal barrier that we are all equal and our abilities are not really influenced by the gender that we present it it has to change from there you know we have to first start believing that since we are a woman that does not equate to us being okay with paid with being paid less and with doing work which is less intellectual or which is less exciting or whatever may be the circumstances so i think this is a lot a lot of this depends upon how we as individuals as women look at ourselves and therefore what kind of uh, presence to we leave in the room once we can work on that i'm sure a lot of this will continue to change on the external environment also and i think the other thing that i've experienced in a lot of these workplaces is also women tend to shy away from building social relationships you know they don't reach out for advice for mentorship and again if one has to rise in a leadership role and if you want to get good work you want to be paid equally you also have to be able to have those sponsors for you in the professional environment so therefore i think the peer to peer community is very important for women and second building this network of people who will speak up for you who will become your sponsor and who will be your flag bearer they are the ones who are going to help you to get this good work to get equal pay so i think this network of mentors advisors we may call them allies or um, friends as well that is very important for us as women to also build in our workplaces and in personal life so that we can continue to go forward in that journey and see now i do want to just point out one little data point which of course uh, can take this to a different level india is i think the only second country which also offers now equal pay to women and men cricket players starting last october so this is just one data point which i thought is relevant which does demonstrate the fact that yes government is cognizant of this the country is cognizant and they are trying to take baby steps but of course it it is a huge thing to really be able to change that mindset and then translate that into a behavioral change but yes i think we we have to change mindset of other people but most importantly we have to change our own mindset unless we can do that we will not be able to influence and inspire other people around us so i think it's very important i i stop here thanks so i think very very well articulated and i completely agree that you know first uh, this is uh, this should be an acceptance in our own mind many times i find the colleagues friends and very very intelligent women also they feel they are, they, they they are satisfied being a little submissive or at uh, underplaying and uh, even if they are they are at the second or third or fourth place when they deserve to be on first they are quite contented and happy about it because they probably accepted in their mind that that first place is perhaps reserved for the natural be leaders who which are more stereo typing for a man so i think yes you need to identify your skill set your personality your uh, uh, environment and uh, once you accept as as uh, aisha very rightly said that you are not uh, you 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 should why should why you should uh, getting the less amount of salary or less intellect or work uh, you know uh, perhaps the, there comes the first step and then then perhaps you by once you are convinced then you are better able to convince others as well there are several hurdles i would say that the path is not easy for in any sector but uh, once you are uh, convinced in your own mind uh, you know and you 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 are not ready to compromise uh, perhaps you you will make a way for yourself as well as handhold for many others too i would move to dr smita kayal uh, an uh, oncologist um, a very passionate uh, you know in patient care a very intellectual 
person. So, Smita, what is your experience and what you want to give advice uh, to others uh, for these questions? First of all, I thank you, Dr. Jyoti, for this invitation and making me part of this wonderful forum. Several learnings here from all other members who are sharing their experiences. So I'll say that I have been in oncology for almost last 15 years, starting from my student and as a junior faculty and as a mid-level faculty. And now I'm heading the department for last three months. So along this journey, there has been several challenges and opportunities in different areas in different uh, aspects. So some of the present challenges which I have as leading the department are like uh, many a times there are subconscious biases, as you say, that uh, I mean the decision to whether to confront them or to let go is on a day-to-day -day basis. That sometimes when people are not accepting your leadership in different areas, then whether to confront, whether to let it go, to find a pathway to navigate and make your authority, uh, authority known to people is difficult sometimes. But I'm fortunate that I have come across several friends and leaders and mentors who have been helping me in navigating this path. My colleagues are many a time supportive, but I want to understand from other people when there are some snide remarks and benign like remarks that sometimes people quote that like woman-like behavior. So how do you handle this problem of when men or your colleagues say like women like behavior and it's not directly at you. It may be in a common forum just uh, for a discussion that, uh, I mean, label to somebody else. But how do you handle that situation? And how do you, I mean, make people recognize that these are not easy things to handle. And then we should be not, I mean, in the common forum, the leaders, people in leadership should not be giving remarks like this. So I think, uh, again, uh, very important points you made. And uh, as you rightly said that, you know, it's not very easy for the society also because they have a certain kind of mindset since uh, long, since long, long years. And even, you know, when you sit in the interview panels, you feel that your colleagues and, uh, you know, they feel that when, when a woman candidate is in front, they always start calculating that, oh, uh, whether, whether she's married, whether she's having children or whether she's planning to have children, whether she will go on maternity leave or whether what could, what would be the work loss, et cetera. And these all calculation put together, these are, are not the law of land. These are not on paper, but these things, uh, you know, are uh, in some or the other manner become deciding factor when there are two, uh, two same, uh, you know, the, the two people with same skills are sitting in front or at times, even if that woman is having little more skills also. So these are the subconscious bias one needs to deal with it. One of the uh, officer and leading position told me that, uh, you know, uh, her or oh, her juniors were having a problem to salute her while she uh, joined the, you know, that kind of a responsible positions and taking orders from her. So, and gradually, gradually she has to make a mark and she has to really, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, establish that kind of authority. So it's a more harder path uh, for a woman than a man. It is uh, whatever somebody will say, but uh, you know, this is a day-to-day, -day, as you said, it's a day-to-day -day experience that uh, you know, we, have to, uh, we have to prove ourselves more than a man uh, because of the you know, mindset. But I'm glad that still there are a lot of changes which, is, uh, which are happening in, in places, in different places. And gradually this is stereotyping is also getting diluted. One of the experiment I would like to mention because you asked one question that a uh, few children, they are of six to 10 years age and they were shown a picture and they were asked to identify with a possible gender. So like a firefighter and uh, a, do a surgeon, doctor, then a teacher, a homemaker, uh, you know, a business person, those kind of things. And they, uh, so majority of the children, they identified firefighter as a male, uh, a surgeon as a male, uh, uh, you know, a business person as a male, while homemaker, teacher, and dancer as a female. And actually they put the live examples and everybody was opposite of that gender than children was surprised. So this comes very early in the brains, how our training and our society, society's perception and the stereotyping comes very early in the age. So perhaps we have to work right from there. We have to start working in our home situations, uh, each one and uh, in our early schooling, colleges, everywhere. 
so i think it's a it's a it's a mission which uh, which needs a lot of a lot of effort from each one and uh, first thing is like uh, you start with acceptance again as you said about the um, uh, the remarks the woman like behavior so it is a stereotyping because it is perceived that certain kind of behavior is more uh, so i think uh, the i think one need to confront and prove that this is not a woman kind of behavior and it's a candidature which matters rather than gender alone and we will discuss more on this as we'll move on this panel so uh, now i'll move to ms um, sangmitra singh Uh, so sangmitra your your thoughts and uh, what we are uh, discussing how to survive in a political world deal with lot of policies and you lead many things uh, so your advices and with uh, glimpses from your own journey thank you thank you dr jyoti um this is this is a very very important issue that we are talking about um and in fact tomorrow's uh, theme for uh, uh, women's day talks about uh, um digital uh, the digital divide and the need to also empower women in the digital world and essentially um, the inequalities that we are talking about today they uh, they are a culmination of a number of deep seated factors so gender inequality is something that is uh, persisting for centuries centuries and it's manifesting in different shapes and forms so we see discrimination against women in leadership positions in jobs in access to health services in in day to day life and uh, the fact that we have normalized the challenges that women face in in day to day life even in the most um i would say progressive work environments the fact that it is understandable that a woman has the responsibility to take care of a child has caregiving a uh, burden at home but is supposed to serve uh, you know the same kind of hours is supposed to uh, basically navigate the system with the same kind of uh, setup as men do it reflects an inherent uh, lack of understanding that we have for how women's responsibilities on a day to day basis are different and um i personally feel that i've been very lucky i've been i'm i'm a scientist by uh, education and now i'm working in this uh, uh, policy space but i do um, acknowledge and uh, respect the fact that there is an army of uh, people in my life in my personal life who are making this happen you know who are making uh, it possible for me to uh work the way i want whether it is my husband or my parents or you know extended family uh and that kind of support system is something that uh every woman is not really uh, blessed with uh the second thing that i would like to talk about is uh, um you know there there were uh, shagun and aisha and others they talked about the self limiting beliefs that women have um well it also stems from the fact that when you are navigating something that very few women have when you see very few women having achieved uh, uh you know say actually having reached a leadership position you automatically start doubting yourself and and uh, thinking that if uh, so few women could then um, will i be able to really navigate the system and uh, there is uh, there are subtle uh, hints at uh, you know i think you talked about it earlier it's very normal to ask uh, a woman when she is planning to have kids whether she's married you know how old is the child and these are all uh, uh, you know discussions which are very very normal but we're not really having them with our male colleagues so there is uh, th- there is this unsaid burden that we are putting on um, uh, women on a day to day basis i also want to flag the fact that you know india has one of the lowest female workforce participations in the world um and there is a reason behind that because uh, we are as a society uh, we are not really conditioning our women to work to 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 really have purpose in life most women in a country like india are working because they need to work and in fact if you look at data from the national family health survey the last round you'll see that actually uh, women's uh, labor force participation it decli- declines with increase in wealth quintile so the richer uh, uh, a woman is the richer family a woman belongs to um, there is this this perceived notion that she doesn't need to work and that is a mindset that we really need to fight because how are we going to get women to become leaders of tomorrow if we fundamentally don't uh, instill in them uh, this thought that you need to work to have a purpose in life uh, so i'd like to stop with that so i think uh, extremely well uh, articulated that uh, they 
the mindset needs a change that they need to have a purpose. And you so, you so correctly said that this is uh, ingrained in many, many, uh, you know, people's brain and right from the beginning, as I was also explaining with that example from childhood, uh, you know, perceptions that uh, they, if they need not to work, why they should work. So, you know, this kind of uh, uh, change is very much uh, needed. And um, uh, with this, uh, so, so these, uh, these stereotyping needs a uh, break and uh, we need to work on several, several, uh, you know, um, multi-pronged, multi uh, you know, approach and multi-pronged manner to, uh, to break these uh, barriers. So I will uh, also now uh, take on board Ms. Swati Pandey. So uh, Swati, uh, you, are, uh, you are doing phenomenal work. So you are a leader in your field, as well as you are supporting underprivileged women. So I want to hear from you, uh, you know, while you were, um, while you were doing uh, 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 to support these underprivileged sector of women, there was, uh, there must be a lot of challenges you must have faced. So I want to hear from you uh, on this and what is your uh, perception when you interacted with those women and uh, how we can uh, actually handhold and support uh, that sector. Swati, can you hear us? So if, if there is some, uh, uh, you know, connectivity issue, uh, Manmi, please check in there while uh, in the interest of time, well, I'll move to Shachi. So Shachi, you, you want to uh, give some uh, tips, uh, uh, you know, on how women leader uh, should navigate and uh, network uh, with other colleagues and um, about mentorship issues as well and uh, you know how you want to suggest other other fellow colleagues from your journey thank you dr bajpai and uh, i'm really happy to be here hi am i audible yeah very much please thank you uh, really happy to be here and can i just uh, also applaud you on a great attempt at pronouncing my name because that's usually where everybody stumbles <laughs> whenever i join a panel so thank you for saying shati right um, I just wanted to start off, you know, uh, by appreciating everything that the incredibly strong women leaders in this panel have already said. But one takeaway that I have had as just a, a rapt audience is that it's so clear now that a lot of the challenges that we as women face are universal experiences. None of us is on a unique journey. All of us are facing such similar challenges. And it's so important also for us to come together share these stories and share the sort of lessons we have learned and, and moved ahead from. Um, so, you know, just also talking about this sort of, because it's been mentioned, the, the imposter syndrome that women face of, am I really worthy? Uh, am I right to be here? A another challenge which came into my mind when it came to like, why aren't we more, uh, you know, vocal? Why aren't we more in the front? Is because I think there's also a fear of being labeled. And this is something I have personally experienced where I have a male colleague who is equally ambitious, equally passionate, but has been very quick to label me as aggressive, uh, assertive, uh, difficult to work with. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's also typical, again, from a stereotypically gender lens that women are viewed on who they are supposed to be. And when they don't fit into that sort of meek, uh, humble uh, mold uh, and are sort of posturing as a more uh, male stereotype, they are then labeled poorly. And that also curbs your, uh, you know, uh, opportunities of growth because somebody feels, oh, she's, she's too strong. I, I don't want to work with her, right? Uh, that was one thing that I wanted to sort of also highlight that that is definitely a challenge that we face. And um, it is then coming down to changing institutional mindsets on how we need to appreciate confident women. We need to celebrate confident women and not label them as difficult. Um, the second was, you know, whereas um, we might attempt to be very proactive in creating a network, like one of the panelists mentioned, it's so important to have that mentorship and peer network and, you know, like a senior person who's advocating for you. I think uh, another sort of piece that comes in uh, for women, especially, is finding that very fine balance. Because, uh, you know, when you are creating your network, you're not creating it only with other women leaders, you're creating a network which is, um, you know, uh, irrespective of gender, and you don't want to be misinterpreted. 
so the way we go about uh, our approach to creating friendships and networks again is a very delicate balance to come across as professional and yet still maintain you know a great working relationship and a great professional conversation because you know men all join a whatsapp group men can go out drinking men can take trips together and suddenly everybody is one big family and everybody is you know bhai 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 and then you're not really privy to that circle you can't break into that uh, circle of them sharing information and getting to know each other and supporting each other and then you know you have to find your own unique way of ensuring that you uh, create and maintain those relationships within what you want your network to be which includes men and women um another part that you know uh, again a lot of people i'm sure do face is that you might have been hired because of your technical skills and your managerial skills but they break, they come into doubt because you do get told that oh you're just here to fill a quota you're just a diversity hire itne percent aurton ko recruit karna tha isliye tumne kar liya and then you have to work that much harder to you know prove yourself and say no i deserve to be here and finally you know we have to realize that the sort of stereotyping of gender is not only harmful to women it's also harmful to men because it's also affecting the way they make their professional and career decisions it's affecting the way they mature emotionally do they create empathy do they lean on each other emotionally like you know i have a support group of women who really build me up and i genuinely believe that nobody cheers you like your group of women nobody en- encourages you like your group of women but do men have that opportunity do men have the opportunity of being completely vulnerable do men have the chance of saying you know what maybe a professional life is not for me i want to be a homemaker i want to be a teacher i want to be a cook do i want to be a dancer and us stereotyping across the board is also harmful across the board and then finally i just wanted to say you know i think it's important for us to sit back and just brush off the labels people are going to think what they want to think if we are going to spend a lot of our mental energy focused on their thinking as opposed to our intentionality which is what is driven right how someone perceives you is up to you it's in your hands so be present be intentional be visible be confident if anyone has to label you they will they are wasting their time you keep doing your work keep being heard and ensure you're there front and center proving that you deserve to be there thank you back to you so fantastic i think uh, you have said uh, many things and uh, very very precisely and uh, very rightly we need to shed this stereotyping it is not only a woman issue it is essentially a human issue and uh, if we actually uh, can in some what I, i understand that it cannot go drastically immediately but if we start taking those infantile steps also today and if we actually all of us men women put together if we are convinced in our minds that this stereotyping is actually bad for everyone and society per se as a whole then we can perhaps uh, move on the sorbet and uh, can be much more neutral we don't want extra privileges but we want really to be seen as neutral as you rightly said this quota issue again i want to give an example of our own survey so uh, one of the men because they are the men who are also responding to this gender climate survey in oncology in india so he said uh, very uh, loud and uh, you know emphatically that you know women they want to take best of the both worlds they want to say that we are skillful and this and that and they also want to take those uh, extra privileges and uh, in counter argument another woman said that from uh, you know centuries put together the this is the underprivileged sector so let's come on the board equally and then start competing you know as you rightly said there are uh, different biology there are different perception at a home societal every level i will show you the covid impact even with this pandemic also women get more hampered than any other so these are the natural barriers which we have to face all the time so uh, you know once the board is similar for both uh, then perhaps uh, start, stop having those kind of extra privileges till the time perhaps those extra privileges are also okay so that this leadership should be um, acquired by women leaders as well and um, 
many times you know with uh, with the, with your own uh, efficiency your own skills only you get the, those things but then also people perceive as that that you are perhaps from that quota or diversity question you are getting that thing so i think we need change in mindset swati now i can see you at the, i think there was some connectivity issue yes. so i want to hear from you your efforts towards those underprivileged women and also from your journey how you navigate uh, the hurdles yeah good evening everybody good evening uh, dr jyoti it's absolutely fantastic group of women you've got here you know it's an eye opener in many ways and a learning uh, issue for us um uh, let me uh, you know i will deal with this a little differently a social issue and a social crusader um i work in india post though i have been in many other departments it's generally a, a department that's grappled with a branding issue you know like what is the relevance of india post is the general question among everybody amongst that you are a lady in india post and of course you will look into this social aspects of it but i would also like to tell you that we in the department we run the biggest bank in the country we are three times bigger than the state bank of india why this is important because we also do financial inclusion and i'm sure everybody here on the board who've handled women and their financial issues know that's the big red letter area that women you know because of their not having is incomes or access to incomes directly are not the target audience for financial inclusion now when a woman sits on the board i've often asked this question what is it that she brings to the board or brings to the table and i mean a business board you know the general answer jyoti comes empathy dr sachi says empathy you know like i agree with you in fact dr sachi i think you resonated and you actually took away all my words so i have to redo what i want to say <laughs> but so the question comes she brings kindness patience empathy diversity you know the main thing that they forget is you get business you get in the numbers you are there because you are capable not because somebody has put you there of largesse we are not there about largesse we are there because we are 1 plus 1 it's the way we function is different not the function that is different so for me taking up the social challenge of you know opening up kamatipura and bringing the children who have no kyc into the ambit of uh, inclusion and dbt schemes direct benefit transfer schemes i was very very you know reluctant about this say why the reason is that i'm a woman the moment you handle a so you know societal issue you are branded औरतें oh, हैं करना क्या है काम धंधा तो इनको है नहीं दैट इज वॉट इज यू नो वेरी सो यू वी हैव एक्चुअली डिंग डोंग आई वॉज एन एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट एन अर्लियर जन्मा सो आई वुड से वी डिंग डोंग फ्रॉम अ सिंडरेला कॉम्प्लेक्स टू अ सुपर ह्यूमन कॉम्प्लेक्स नीदर वे वी सिंडरेलाज देन नॉर आर वी सुपर ह्यूम टूडे ऑफकोर्स प्लीज गिव एस अ ब्रेक but you know that's what they boxed us into the real danger is not men versus women the real danger lies in our old frontal cortex you know we have boxed ourselves today all the performers achievers when you say she heroes achievers performers cut the crap let's not use this word we are just the other sex who are there in this new arena trying out our capacities our destinies and our dreams and that's it we are not here as heroes you know this is a term term i absolutely detest when people say you're a achiever you're a power woman no nothing nada i'm just an ordinary person somebody's wife somebody's daughter somebody's mother and somebody's boss also i think that's the perspective difference jyoti that we need to understand that we if we were boxed to a cinderella complex let us not get boxed to a super woman complex either leadership is also about owning up to your own you know um, weaknesses your foibles and yet going along business as usual so if it's business as usual for a man it's it's business as usual for a woman in a different perspective we have a unique perspective they have a unique perspective if they say they're logical we are empathetic but you know it's eventually each of us bring what is best for our organization our sector or where we work so um i wouldn't want to talk more about you know the societal impact because 
often we get clam she's a lady she won't understand business of course she'll do the societal impacts i am going to be the rebel in this gang there we mean business uh, the truth is that my region when i joined brought in about you know uh, 220 crores of business after three and a half years of my tenure i topped the country in business i've got about 600 crores last year so this is what we bring to the table also in a hard hitting man's world of numbers get in the numbers once you get in the numbers you are a part of the equal gang you know not comfortable with you but doesn't matter discomfort is sahi you're part of the gang thank absolutely. you absolutely so i think uh, again uh, you know uh, uh, very well said and very well said that uh, you know we are the we are only another person so uh, stop expecting demanding that we should behave in a super human super woman manner multitasking worshiping we just want to be the way we are and accept it the way we are absolutely uh, they, yeah so i think uh, this is a uh, this is again breaking stereotyping and moving i also want to hear again from you because you were you worked a lot on that kamathipur area and uh, these are the very underprivileged women so if you have some important um, you know lesson learned from uh, while you were working with them and you want to put uh, forward in this forum because uh, perhaps from here it go a long way uh, then please uh, you know put a crisp uh, you know message the only thing i will tell yeah the only thing that i will tell you what i learned is that strength is everywhere please do not call them underprivileged they just faced a different circumstances in life and they have you know handled it the best way they can but each of them is a person with equal grit and determination like us and the truth is today when i walked into kamatipura i went to save them and i come back they're just equal partners you know it's a different it's a difficult situation they have taken that as the profession do not go saving anybody go and augment you know augment and amplify the lesson i learned is that you can't you know whether you are needing the savior or they are needing the savior that comes as a question mark but please amplify and augment gap areas that is the only thing i can say absolutely again it is it is an another profession so another person with another profession and definitely uh, you know we need to respect and respect the choices and their circumstances that is a loud and clear message i will move to talk to reena nayar so one of the very senior very respectful manner in our oncology community and um, so uh, we want to hear from you your experience and also uh, you know many many people i am i am receiving requests from many uh, you know people in their mid mid career or their while they are trainees fellows that uh, they face a ganging up against them and you know uh, you know, Shachi also very uh, clearly said that you know it's difficult to be one of them when they are going out in evenings for the joining for drinks and they become very close and closely supporting each other to so how to break that and how to face that gang up issues because majority of the time while you are trying to raise the ladder you are one and there are several other people who are uh, trying to validate you also they are not liking a woman standing beside as a leader or at times crossing you. so how to deal with that and at times even uh, people face the issue that a uh, much less skillful much junior person given an authoritative role or leadership role a woman is denied of so how to deal with those conditions so jyoti thanks a lot it's been you know a real learning and i can almost look back and kind of say what are the mistakes that i have made <laughs> as i grew over the last 35 years in oncology you know the medical profession i think has been far more uh, supported or supportive of the women than many other professions and we can make that out so easily from the discussions that we have had of women in different roles across but having said that uh, we you know i like uh, the panelists saying that it is a lot to do with us internally and if i look back i would say yes it was an internal um, Uh, an internal uh, you know thought that if i am seen to be aggressive if i am seen to be noisy 
if I have an opinion, if I am seen confident, then I may lose more than I may gain. And so I honestly have followed a middle path at most of the times. And uh, to be even more honest, when I started 35 years back, on most of the forums, I would find I was the only woman who was speaking. I was the only woman on the panel. I had really nobody else around to uh, kind of discuss these issues. And uh, today I can not only say that, yes, I made the mistakes and how will I improve? Not for my own self, but definitely at workplace, I feel it is my duty now to make it more safe and more friendly for the women who are there. There are people who have a little bit of problems. And again, it is my duty to be the helping hand for them. Maybe sometimes give them that little extra chance, even if I see that there is somebody else who deserves it a little more. Uh, being a part of a women's gang, if I may call it, I must make sure that, you know, there are people whom I stand by and if they can benefit a little more, uh, no harm. And uh, when I look at the people whom I have helped, I'm kind of happy to see Jyoti where she has reached. So even if I didn't achieve, when I see Jyoti achieving, it must give me the maximum happiness that, you know, people will break this glass ceiling at some point of time if there are other women who stand by. Most importantly, I think if we have to change, everybody has discussed that, you know, it has to come from the society. It has to come from our homes. We have to change the way we bring up both gender of our children, not only the girls, but also the boys. We have to make sure that we, you know, kind of instill in them that financial stability and security is more important than the rest of the things that the world may tell our daughters. And if we continuously uh, do this, especially, you know, the women who have kind of now gone through the, uh, let's say, the heat and the dust of rising, if they start speaking at forums like this again and again and again, I'm sure it will sink into the minds of people. And if there are women at home, I think we must help them too. Because very often you will hear the older women saying, we bhi to apne zamane mein rather than saying, okay, you are doing something different and let me stand by you. I also feel, you know, we keep speaking again and again about what is our problems, but we also need to have solutions for this. And sometimes I feel that the minimum solutions that you can start with, and there are so many women today in, you know, so many different areas that I feel... Uh, Child care facilities is something that is required if we want our women to work and work with their minds at work and not with their minds at home. And this is especially true for all the mid career and the young women, especially when you know they are working, when they are going out to make their presentations, when they are staying that extra hour to finish their, uh, whatever we may say in our field, it would be papers, research, writing, uh, we must have something which will support these women. Everybody cannot come from a family which has a lot of support. There will be a lot of women from nuclear backgrounds and we have to encourage them also. So I think there is a multi-pronged plan which should be there and we can. the older women can be a part of making sure that it happens in the community. The middle order women can help the younger women and together we can move much further than just putting the blame on the male section of the society or putting the blame on our old thoughts. I think we have to change. So I think uh, very nicely summarized uh, and, uh, you know, there are pearls of wisdom from each one of you. And I think uh, the audience will, be very, will uh, derive a lot of benefits if, uh, you know, and each person is a little different and each circumstance is also a little different. So what uh, suits your needs best uh, you should uh, you know gather and move forward in the sector i i would say that uh, mentorship and sponsorship are two more two very very important things you need to learn to navigate you learn you need to learn to find your mentors and sponsors and you know be a little outgoing in that because this is also one of the uh, you know aspect women are not networking as much as they wish they are hesitant they are not uh, that much open and that also hinders their progress. Uh, we need support, inclusions, collaborative efforts. Even if uh, somebody cannot do one-to-one, -one, there is possibility of distant mentorship, distant sponsorship. And, you know, I, I'm part of uh, a few societies like ESMO, 
uh, our own Indian Society of Medical and Pediatric Oncology and Immuno Oncology Society, etc., wherein we are trying to really make uh, 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 an, uh, an effort and a list wherein uh, mentors and mentees uh, which suits each other's and we can establish those distant links. So perhaps that can uh, really be uh, beneficial for many, many women to rise in their careers. Also, as uh, Dr. Nair very rightly said that they, we need to support, we need to, so if, uh, um, if a woman is now in a, in a position uh, with whatever hurdles, et cetera, they face, but if now you're seeing somebody, uh, you know, uh, a junior to you uh, uh, at your same cadre or even at times senior to you, you can support differently. And uh, there, there also comes a hurdle that, uh, you know, at times you are in a position that men is not supporting, they are, they are with their own peer groups and their, uh, their own uh, sectors. But is also not supporting you and you, you find yourself really alone and uh, that path becomes more difficult. So perhaps we need to handhold a fellow woman, junior, senior, anybody. And uh, a small example, you know, if you got an invitation to, to give a talk or to, uh, to write uh, an editorial, et cetera, in, uh, in science sector and similar kind of opportunities in different sectors for other people, and you can't really do that for your uh, busy uh, schedules, then perhaps you can suggest two or three uh, fellow woman colleagues' names, so at least they will get some tar for the stage. This will be a very small help, but perhaps it will be important for her career building and her visibility. So I think we should be, we should be making conscious efforts to uh, do such things. Um, this is uh, an example uh, of RASMO Women and Oncology Committee, and uh, I would like to mention about Solange Peters, who was a visionary president from ASMO, and she has brought into a lot of changes. Before her, there were only a few women who were in the executive committee or different committees, and she perceived that need and her efforts and her uh, effective voice makes a lot of change in the society. So there are several other issues also I would like to hear from Dr. from uh, Mrs. Uh, Sujata Sonic also, the same questions, uh, you know, uh, about her journey, the hurdles she faced and how she navigated in retrograde, what she wanted to do um, if, uh, if, uh, if it was, uh, you know, given a chance that she could do differently. So for some last minute commitment, she could not uh, directly join. There's some connectivity uh, issues, etc. So she sent her messages and Nirav, you can please play on this. Uh, Dr. Jyoti, that's a very interesting question you've asked. And um, I think in general, in all spheres, uh, women have to work hard to prove themselves because there is an overall impression that is very generalized that women tend to take leave uh, or will come late and leave early from the office or they will not be prepared for a meeting or that they could be confused, uh, mixing up things. Uh, and then the, the other extreme is that, oh, she has an attitude, oh, she is very difficult to uh, convince. Um, sometimes uh, it is said that, you know, um, she does not uh, listen um, and she follows her own voice, etc. So there are these stereotype images that we will often see around us. And I, I'm sure that in your own uh, journey up the ladder, you may have faced something similar. Uh, speaking for myself, I would say that, um, you know, um, you have to uh, really work hard and um, um, your, your good work has to be noticed. And many a times it so happens that even if you've done good work or you think you've done good work, it still is not acknowledged because it is seen as, uh, you know, you, you're doing your, something on your own uh, that does not have really the sanction of the superiors or uh, things like that. So, yeah, that's been my experience. So, you know, handling the hurdles, I think all of us have our own unique ways of dealing with it. Um, first of all, you try not to allow it to get under your skin too much. And, um, you know, um, you have to remain very equanimous about the whole affair and try and uh, keep doing your work. So I deal with it like this, that I get fully immersed in whatever work or duties have been assigned to me. And I try to go into the details of what can be done better in terms of the processes that we follow or whether I can propose a new way of doing things. Um, I also keep an open ear for uh, feedback, uh, listening to other voices um, 
and trying to understand for myself whether uh, what we are doing is the only or the best way or if things can be improved. So uh, I think just focusing on your work during your professional time is the best way to handle it and that's how I handled it. Well, what I have observed in myself is that over the years, you learn to deal with it better. You know, I think with time comes maturity, with experience comes better understanding. Uh, you also build very good bonds within uh, you know, your professional network. You find people who mentor you, who support you, who help you to overcome your doubts, including self-doubt, and who act as a you know, sounding board for you to go and ask uh, you know, uh, questions about what is it that you're doing which is probably causing a problem. And that helps a lot. So I feel that in every stage of your career, in every decade of your career, you will have a different response. And that is uh, very typically related to uh, your own age and experience in the system. As you grow older, you maybe become a little wiser and um, you, you find that you take it better. You take it on your chin. And um, you also develop a lot of self-confidence over the years. And I think for me personally, the most important factor is that I always ask this question before I take a major decision is that what is it that I believe in? Because I feel we all have to follow certain ethical principles, something based on, you know, morals and, uh, and also the rules that uh, provide the framework for the work we do. And uh, yes, there is some discretion available which can be exercised. I tend to exercise it in favor of those who are needy and for those who perhaps do not have the strength, uh, you know, or the uh, access to go right to the top and seek redressal. So I tend to help the, the most vulnerable. Aside of that, I think I, um, you know, I take a call on uh, how much um, is uh, to be um, sort of let go. Uh, and um, most of the time, I try and do my work without any regrets. So uh, sometimes it gets really hard. It's not easy. Uh, but you have to ask this question at the end of every decision you take. Um, that do you uh, feel comfortable with what you have agreed to do? And if you do, then you move on. You don't have to look back. So thank you very much. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, Nero, again, my slides, please. Uh, Madam, reshare. You need to just reshare it from where you have. Okay, so towards the end, actually. So meanwhile, I will ask my uh, any of the panelists, do you have any burning remarks? We are towards the end. So um, if there is any uh, burning remark, question, comment, uh, uh, you know, you can please uh, uh, come. Shagun, you want to say something? Oh, uh, no, I mean, not exactly. This was such a riveting conversation. I think everyone spoke with so much passion. The only thing I would say is that, you know, sometimes I get taken aback because what I think is a common, uh, what all of us are joined together with a common experience, that's not often the case. And even with some women leaders that I came across very recently, you know, some of them are like their heads of uh, important institutions and uh, mostly from the corporate sector. But even this idea of you know, why should we have pay parity, gender pay parity? You know, for me, it's like, why would you question that? But there are these notions that, oh, you know, for women, women don't want it. Women are happy. Why are we pushing? So I think for us, it's not just to change, you know, the thing of men, but a, there's a lot of sensitization. And I, I think we have underestimated how much we need to do even to bring uh, people together to a common point. Uh, so I, I would say that, but a, a very, very interesting conversation. Thanks a lot, Dr. Jyoti. So thank you. Very crisp comment from each one of you. Uh, Shachi, you want to take it? So crisp comment from each one and then we will end. Thank you, Dr. Vajpayee. Uh, just want to say thank you to everybody. It's been a fantastic conversation. And the, the one comment I do want to make uh, for the young women that uh, are watching or may watch this video is that just forget about the labels. Don't bother what anybody is saying. We put so much pressure on ourselves based on what someone else's perception is. And that should not matter to us. All that should matter is that we are present, we are intentional, and that we are very, very enthused because everybody who, every woman who has come before us 
has created a space where we can flourish and we're going to keep doing it for the women that come after us so just keep trying reach out to us and we're there to support you thank you aisha thank you so much it was absolutely energizing to hear everyone i just have to tell everyone that one should just not compromise their health while they're going upward in their journey of leadership i think health is very very important we just have to figure out what does good health mean for us and how do we want to balance that health to be able to also emerge as a great leader please continue to maintain good physical health good mental health and like we have discussed social relationships are absolutely a big key and if you are able to you know take a little bit of all of these and then combine with that meaningful purpose we get in our life we will definitely emerge as great leaders as great women leaders that's all thank you well said so sangamitra uh thank you dr jyoti this was uh, a terrific conversation uh i'd like to uh, say that uh, we need to focus both on diversity and inclusion in any organization and understand the difference between the two i think uh, we are gradually making that shift uh, to having more women uh, in the workforce we're seeing that there are definitely more uh, women uh, who are uh, joining the workforce but it's important that we move beyond a very tokenistic sort of approach where uh, uh, you know there is one board member there's one senior uh, person uh, in the group i think uh, women need to really be heard they need to be valued they need to be uh, appreciated and uh, it needs to be done in every sphere for them to really succeed as leaders thank you uh, we have arti from your side um that was a, a very very uh, very very in you know inspirational uh, conversations that i have witnessed this evening thank you so much for inviting me dr jyoti uh, yes i would agree with a lot of my colleagues here that mentorship inclusion diversity is all that we need to do take forward looking after our health and the health of everybody around us so thank you so much thank you smita yes dr jyoti it's such a fabulous conversation and as all of us we are discussing we need to fight our internal biases and internal stereotypes and to rise above all our internal fears and then take equal opportunities what is available to us and prove our worth with our work so work should speak for us and that will carry us forward and we should provide equal opportunities to people who are working under us well said uh, tejasvi uh, thank you so much for this uh, enriching uh, discussion uh, i just want to uh, request to all that uh, uh, many of us are the achievers in real sense but there are women uh, women around us uh, who are really struggling to uh, balance their uh, work and the family life and i think uh, one can become achiever in true sense a successful person in the field in which uh, she is working only when this balance is achieved so the ones who are struggling for uh, achieving this balance uh, this hand holding by the uh, uh one of us is uh, required so let's do it for them and uh, let's uh, uh, you know try to be them uh, equally successful in the uh, fields that they have chosen thank you thank you uh, swati dr nair so uh, it's you know something very nice to hear i i think i am the oldest in the group and perhaps i have changed seen the maximum change that has happened and at least in today's forum it's so nice to see women have already achieved so much in less than a generation needless to say we are the lucky women and we need to hand holds for very very many other women who are actually trying to climb this ladder and i'm sure meetings like this as they our kind of the word spreads around we will have lots of people who will come up to hold hands take other women together and make this place a better place so thanks jyoti again for a great interaction with so many women who have achieved so much in their lives thank you and uh, this is my last slide my take on gender equity it is 
time that we all see gender as a spectrum instead of two sets of opposing ideals. Uh, next time you are about to call a little girl bossy, say instead she has executive leadership skills. Culture does not make people, people make culture. If it is true that the full humanity of women is not our culture, then we can and must make it our culture. Men are from Earth, women are from Earth, uh, deal with it. So with this, I will really end and uh, I will ask Dr. Anita Ramesh, uh, our chair, if you have any burning comment in the end, and then we can finish. Uh, Madam Dr. Anita is not there. I think she left. Okay, fine. So I think, uh, you know, indeed it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, I'm so much thrilled, I would say, and overwhelmed. It was uh, such an intense discussion. Everybody uh, spoken so spontaneously from their own journeys. And there are uh, ups and downs and how they navigate, how they rise the ladder and lots of, uh, you know, take homes, I would say. And um, with this, uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, we need to accept in the circumstances we are, we need to accept our own personalities, we need to accept our uh, colleagues, our, uh, ir you know, irrespective of gender, and uh, try to make progress for ourselves as well as our fellow colleagues. Uh, with this, I would end and uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, great discussion this evening and my uh, very, very best wishes on International Women's Day to each one of you. Uh, I hope uh, we will make, uh, we will take infantile steps and continue to make progress in the orbit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. If everybody is on the camera, can we have a quick picture, Nirav? Uh, just a second, ma'am. Like few if of the people. Everybody can on the camera. I would request a virtual picture. Arina, madam, you can also switch on the camera. So I was a minute late. I think maybe we can have a picture of whosoever is there. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. It's done. Thank you so much. I have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was really wonderful. Thank you, it was a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank I you. really like the term the work. Our work should speak for us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Have a nice time. So over to Neera. Anything more is left? No, no, ma'am. You're you're given the closure. And her team uh, for support. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.